Vitamin D deficiency has been associated with conditions like autoimmune disease, cardiovascular disease, cancer, depression, dementia, infection, bone health, and muscle health. And there may be a few more, but I think you guys get the gist of it. Now, more research definitely needs to be done to determine exactly what's going on here. Does the low vitamin D levels lead to the development of these conditions? Or does the existence of these conditions cause the low vitamin D? We don't exactly know, but we do know that vitamin D definitely plays a role and that for many people, it's an area that can be supported and help them to improve their health. But what is vitamin D and how much of it should we be taking? We'll cover all of that in today's video. And of course, if you like this kind of content, I always appreciate it if you can give this video a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, and also ring the bell. I post videos every single Thursday, and that'll let you know when new content goes live. My name is Dr. Brad Bodel, and I specialize in helping women with Hashimoto's and low thyroid to lose weight and improve their energy naturally. And one of the big things that we want to do when it comes to Hashimoto's and autoimmune disease is support someone's immune system. The better that we can support their immune system, the more likely it is that it is more stable for them and there's less chance of flare-ups. One of the key factors for that is doing things like making sure vitamin D levels are adequate for good immune system function. But let's start off by defining vitamin D for you. Vitamin D is a vitamin which we can acquire through our diet, supplementation, or exposure to sunlight. Now sometimes you'll hear people refer to it as a hormone, which is also correct. Once it's in our system, it circulates through the bloodstream and it interacts on a cellular level, driving specific physiological changes, just like other hormones. Some of those responses include things like dampening inflammation, promoting cell growth, and as we said before, having a normal immune response. Since it's involved in some of those fundamental physiological areas, it makes sense that low vitamin D can be associated with some of the conditions that we listed before. Additionally, because it's so critical in helping us to manage inflammation, if you've been dealing with a chronic inflammatory condition, it may be very difficult for you to get your vitamin D levels back up into the normal range until you deal with the thing that is driving inflammation in the first place. Now, when it comes to actually taking vitamin D into our body and using it, there's a few steps that we need to discuss. Vitamin D in and of itself is inactive, and it needs to be converted into an active form so we can use it. I like to compare it to our thyroid hormone pathways where T4 is the main hormone produced by our thyroid gland, and it is inactive. It has to be converted into T3 before it can actually interact with our cells and drive the response that we want to see. When we ingest vitamin D, it's either in the form of ergocalciferol, which is D2, or cholecalciferol, which is D3. But both of these are just different versions of the same inactive vitamin that will eventually need to be converted to be able to be in its active state. Once the D2 or D3 is absorbed into the bloodstream, it is transferred to the liver where it adds a hydroxyl group to it, converting it into 25 hydroxy vitamin D. Now this is the intermediary step of vitamin D and is not yet the active form. However, this is the most stable form in the blood and it's for that reason that this is the marker that is typically measured on your blood labs. Once the initial conversion is made, the 25 hydroxy vitamin D is then transferred to the kidneys where an additional hydroxyl group is added converting it into 125 dihydroxy vitamin D. This is the active form, but it has a very short half-life and degrades in the bloodstream very quickly. Therefore, looking at this number on our blood labs is not a good indicator of overall vitamin D status. Even though it's not 100% clear the effect that the intermediary step of vitamin D has on the body, it's still the best marker to measure and in these cases where more research needs to be done, I always think it's a great idea to combine the labs with the clinical outcomes and how the patient is feeling to make sure we're on the right track. Now when it comes to actually raising the levels of 25 hydroxy vitamin D, I know that I said before that D2 and D3 are essentially the same molecule. However, when we look at the research, D3 or cholecalciferol tends to increase the levels of 25-hydroxyvitamin D to a greater extent 
and it maintains those levels for a longer duration of time. It's for that reason that I prefer to use D3 supplementation that is ideally emulsified in some sort of fat which has been shown to improve absorption. But how much of it should you be taking? The standards recommend that for anyone over the age of one and under the age of 70 should be getting 600 international units or IUs of vitamin D every single day. However, I personally think that this number is too low due to the fact that it assumes that your vitamin D levels are already normal and it doesn't take into account the fact that we're spending much less time outdoors, especially for people who are at higher latitudes during the winter time. In fact, even at this lower recommendation, which I think is a very low bar to clear, it's estimated that in the United States, 92% of men and 97% of women are not meeting their daily recommended intake. And while it'd be nice to be able to pop outside and refill those vitamin D levels, it's estimated that you'd need to spend five to 30 minutes every single day between the hours of 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. just to be able to maintain the levels that we want. And as I alluded to before, this becomes more problematic the further away from the equator you are. So if you're in the United States and you're north of San Francisco, Denver, St. Louis, and Washington, D.C., in the late fall to early spring months, even if you're out in sunlight, you are producing insignificant amounts of vitamin D. And this can make it really problematic, especially for people who are in the lab low range. So while I'm definitely not against going outside, and by the way, there are other benefits to sunlight exposure besides just the production of vitamin D. So keep that in mind. The best way to know how much vitamin D you should be taking is by getting it measured on your blood labs. Most people know that the standard range for vitamin D is 30 nanograms per milliliter to 100 nanograms per milliliter, as anything under 30 is considered inadequate for overall health. However, if you have Hashimoto's or autoimmunity, preliminary research has suggested that you may want higher vitamin D levels than what is considered standard and normal. I usually recommend somewhere between 60 and 80 nanograms per milliliter to make sure that you are optimizing vitamin D levels in the system. But how do we get those levels of vitamin D up? As I said before, I like to use a liquid version of vitamin D3 that is emulsified in some kind of fat like MCT oil. And instead of swallowing it like you would with other supplements, I prefer that my patients place it right underneath their tongue and they hold it there for about 60 seconds. That way, if they have any gastrointestinal issues where they have problems absorbing key nutrients, we bypass that whole system and we put it directly into the sublingual circulation. That way our body can use it. I recommend that my patients take a set amount of vitamin D for a two month period before we decide to retest. Depending on how low your vitamin D levels are when you start will dictate how much vitamin D you take daily. If you're under 20 nanograms per mil on your labs, then you'll wanna start out with taking 12,000 IUs daily. If you're between 20 and 30, you'll wanna take 10,000 IUs daily. 30 to 40, you'll wanna take 8,000 IUs daily, and 40 to 50, you'll wanna take 6,000 IUs daily. Anything above 50, you'll wanna take two to 4,000 IUs daily, which is also what I recommend for maintenance. Any of those applications should be able to get you up into that 60 to 80 nanogram per mil range, which is also what I recommend for optimal health for my patients. Once you're done with your two months, retest and check to see where you're at. Make any necessary adjustments based on your new values and either continue to boost those levels up or switch to maintenance. But I hope you liked today's video. If you have any questions about how vitamin D can help support your Hashimoto's, leave them for me in the comments box below and I'll make sure to get back to them. Also, don't forget to grab my free download, which is electrolytes for Hashimoto's and keto, which I will also link for you in the description box. But that's all for now. I appreciate you guys so much and thank you as always for hanging with me. In fact, I'm looking forward to continuing the conversation. So if there's anything you need, feel free to reach out to me. Lastly, if you could, before you go, please give this video a thumbs up if you liked it, share it with a friend, subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already, and check out some of my other videos. In fact, you can watch last week's right over here. My name is Dr. Brad Bodel. Thank you again. I hope you're having an outstanding week and I will see you guys next Thursday.